Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, our long-form podcast where we talk about what has happened in the week before and look ahead the, to the next week as well. As always, I'm joined by Audio Creator and owner Patrick, and also our very own the Cycling Danes, uh, Mr. Craig himself, Ewan Wilson. And gentlemen, this week we've had a few races going on. Trobo Leon, the Giro started, the Welter FM, and also Frankfurt, that race. So uh, where should we kind of start and, you know, what a week? Uh, where should we start? I feel like we should end, well, I don't know. Should we start with a Giro? It seems important. I know there's some people that like time trials, but I love a TT to start a Grand Tour. I don't know. There's something about when I was sat down just for hours on end, just looking at people who were just, I'm just like, these people aren't going to finish at the top of the time list, but I'm excited to look at it anyway. And it's, I don't know, it's just really nice uh, having a, a TT up. And the, the time started, it, it got to a, re- it was like really a crescendo. Like it started just going faster and faster and faster. And it was kind of a big old, like five minute period where all the big favorites were really setting off and i really enjoyed watching it i mean it was no surprise who kind of won i think a lot of people were expecting it i think was he the overwhelming in the kind of the overwhelming favorite in the um the poll which you had on your live stream i think he was, yeah, um, he was. i think i voted in that i said remco so pat on the back to me for getting it right <laughs> I mean, is anyone going to defeat Remco? I mean, we're a bit disheartened by the margin he had and so many time trial kilometers that we still got left. Is there feasibly any way if we're talking hypothetically, he's not he's not going to come off his bike, there's not going to be any mechanicals, there's yada, yada, yada. Is there anyone who can actually defeat him? Um, it's, I don't know. It was, it's very easy to say, like, yeah, he, he's he's already won it. But let's face it, a Grand Tour isn't won in one stage. It's won over three weeks. So there's still a long way to go. But Remco just getting off on the right foot is certainly kind of putting his best foot forward. And it's going to be so hard for, I don't know, Roglic, Almeida, Teo. We're all kind of looking also very good, also in, all in the top 10. So I reckon those are the main candidates. And, you know, we'll see what happens when we get to the mountains and stuff. But there is still, like, a, what? a week or so over a week until we start getting to some really tough stages so everyone's got to try to stay on the bike for a week yeah Remco's in, in a really comfortable position at the moment probably in in the driving seat to win this but it's only i mean 40 seconds yeah it's a big margin but you could lose that on a stage for instance Teo gagan hart lost 20 seconds today on what was a sprint stage because he was caught up in a racing incident it could happen to remco at some point or whatever but it is seeming a little bit futile i think it'll feel more futile by the end of next week and will sound more defeated than after the time trial in chesna where there's 35 kilometers of time trialing there it wasn't just like remco gained time on the final climb at the end he was the strongest throughout so i mean i think in one week's time will sound even more defeated it is true though it's just He's so good in the mountains. He's so he got such a good team around him. Roglic, the last minute COVID incidents as well, parachuting in different riders here, there, and everywhere. And yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I think you're right about yeah, Jumbo Visma having to bring in these kind of new riders. Like we've got Hessman and Gloke now in the team, both of whom are Grand Tour debutants. And it's something about having that experience in the team, which is almost settling for Roglic. And it's quite just pleasant to have around. I know he's still got Sepp Kuss around, but, you know, it's usually just he likes to have those sort of state men sort of who have been there and done that with him multiple times and it gives him that, that comfort that if something does go wrong then he knows he's got the people there who he's relied upon before to rely upon again whereas you know Glog and Hessman don't know how they're going to perform but it's literally it's a complete unknown they've just joined the world tour this year they're like grand tour debutants it's like how are they going to perform I don't really know I think that Remco yeah being 40 seconds ahead is is a bit demoralizing for the kind of state of the race but I think you know like you and said Taylor lost 20 seconds today it's very possible that something could happen to anybody it doesn't necessarily mean it's Remco but you know riders have capitulated in the last week and lost lots of time before. Think about to like Krauschweg when he lost to Giro, crashing, just something like that. You know, it can happen to anybody. There's still so many more kind of unexpected things that are unaccounted for that can still happen in the next like 19 days. I think it's so funny that Stephen Krauschweg almost won a Grand Tour. Like he was so close to winning a Grand Tour and everyone just yeah. forgot about it afterwards. Like all the discourse was that like, oh yeah, it's done and dusted because he was like evidently the strongest at that race. But I don't know, it would have been so silly in history to look back and see, like, Stefan Kreisweg's name 
on that like Giro list, like Roll of Honor. That would have been strange. Yeah. Stranger than Ryder hates it all. Don't come for Ryder. <laughs> Teo Gegenhardt, Jared Henley. Well, Teo is trying to make it less awkward by like coming back and getting something this year. And to be fair, Jared Henley rode really strongly last year. So I think that's fair enough. And he also well. did finish in second once as well. Yeah, but Steven Kreuzweg, third out of Tour de France. None of these guys have come anywhere near the podium in a Tour de France. Who was fourth in that year's Tour de France? Emu Buchmann. Done. I completely forgot that Kreuzweg finished on the podium of a Tour. I <laughs> literally just completely skipped my mind. 2019 Tour de France. Oh, let me get it. Let me get it. Let me get it down. It, sh- it should have been Thibaut Pino's victory, to be honest. You got what have you got it's, here? A post. It's my favorite edition of the Tour de France. I have a framed edition of the keep from the from the silly stage that Egan Bernal took the yellow jersey. It's the best Tour de France in history. Nothing will top it. Never, 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 never. I refuse to admit that 2022 and 2020 Tour de France were better. But th- that year's top 10, everyone was in the space. Like I think from first down to sixth at one point, the spaces were all within a minute and a half, two minutes. So it was super close. And Kreis Wake, you can thank Lawrence de Plus for that one because he really regulated things in the final week to mean that no one attacked Kreis Wake too much. I mean, massive tangent. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, well, sticking with the Giro, because uh, well, as we all know, we're filming on the Sunday. We've just had uh, stage two, big crash, and then Jonathan Milan took a stage victory. Uh, kind of maybe the new young gun into the sprinting game. I, I mean, we've had Jasper Phillips and etc. They're not exactly old, but who is Jonathan Milan is what probably a lot of people are thinking. He's a track rider, um, primarily. That's where he's kind of originated from. If originated sounds like a like he's spawned like some kind of alien just out of a velodrome like hatching an egg or something but he i don't know he's just kind of really good at pursuits and he's a part of the italian track program he's really good at that and as a consequence of that he's kind of came across the road i remember he did a couple of good prologues and that kind of piqued my interest to start with because usually riders who are good at prologues usually are they have something else kind of hidden away and i always i feel like milan is very much like what Kittle was back in the day, where he's kind of quite good at time trialing. He's a very strong sprinter, very tall as well, let's face it. And I feel like there's a lot to compare between Milan and Kittle. Maybe he is kind of like the new Kittle. That'd be kind of cool. Because I think it was always a shame how Kittle kind of left stage left a bit early, to be honest with you. Um, I feel like it would be cool to have seen what happened, what would happen if if Kittle kind of hung around. But yeah, I've, I mean, I think Milan winning was almost, it wasn't, I don't know, I don't want to say it wasn't surprising. Because like, I think back to earlier this year and I thought, oh, this guy's probably going to win a stage of his Giro. But then it was kind of like, was he going to come here? Was he not? It was kind of a bit up in the air. And then he's kind of landed a stage victory. You could say for, like it was very fortunate because Pedersen might have won if things didn't go the way they did. But he still got a Giro d'Italia stage win on debut at 22 years old. So you can't take that away from him. Yeah. I just want to add, Jonathan Milan's not from Milan. I just want to close that debate. He's That's from the other really side sad. of Italy. It's, but where, where's Peo Bilbao from? Is he not from Bilbao? He's from the Basque country, at least, which is close oh. enough. Um, Jonathan Milan, I think, is from like Friuli, like, well, Veneto, the other side of the country completely. Oh. That's... I know. I know. It's a, it's a shame. He should relocate for the sake of everyone. I mean, that aside, he's also won a stage in uh, the Saudi Tour, the Crow Race as well. And uh, Ewan, do you think his comparison with Marcel Kittle is a fair one for Patrick? Yeah, I, I think in terms of the engine, they, they're both quite similar. Uh, and sort of the way that he appeared and just went vroom, vroom all the way to the line was quite similar to Kittle. Yeah, it was certainly unique. It's, he's quite similar to Phil Bauhaus as well. Bahrain are good at these chaos sprints. And I don't know, Milan and Bilbao both have that in them. And just think what, what could have been possible, the gap he could have had if Dusan Rajevic were here to help him as well. And like like a full Bahrain victorious lead-out train. It would have been cool because it was like Andrea Pascalon was riding it solo. But yeah, it, it was it was good. And I'm intrigued to see what, what they bring. It's, morale is up in that team. It's a sort of old school Italian core to it. I mean, Bahrain is a lot of their staff are from part of Italy that Milan's from towards like for you and Lee Veneto and so forth. Morale is up. Pascalon's doing a good job. And yeah, maybe Milan can win more sprints. But to be honest, I'm really hoping to see David Deccan on, on the top step of the podium. Oh, that was a good shout. I, I think it was a good thing for Bahrain as well when you consider that yesterday in the TT, like their free prong trident GC thing 
a like kind of movie star of Boitago, Caruso, and Haig all completely flopped and lost over like I think the closest was Caruso a minute twenty to Remco. Boitago is two minutes down, and it's like <laughs> your, your GC hopes are just I've just taken a massive dip basically. Like it's it was just like I can't believe how much time was lost, and I don't know what they're going to do with GC now. We're going to have to kind of be inventive, that's for sure. And I think that Milan winning is definitely, like you say, it's a good morale boost and will hopefully set them back on the right track. I mean, do you think he's actually going to win more sprints considering that, as you said, it's just a Pascal on, basically it's his lead out and when Trek aren't... Don't just... come for Pascal on. I, have, I wasn't. I, I wasn't Pascal coming for him. For years, and he's finally getting. He's finally getting his time. I wasn't Sorry. coming for him. I was praising him. He's doing the the work of probably two two lead out riders. Work. He's doing God's work. <laughs> but I mean, Appleton De Koenig, they desperately need someone who can finish this off. And uh, Kenny Groves was in the perfect position, just didn't have it. Yeah, I did find that kind of funny. They were completely in the right place at the right time, and they went around that final roundabout. Right at the front, Groves had like you know perfectly positioned in, and then he was dropped off. I don't know, I wasn't looking at the meters, but yeah, he just got he just got beat straight up, and I was like, "What that Groves?" I, I I thought he was gonna win, to be honest with you, but yeah, Milan when he got when he got going, there was just no stopping him. I think that yeah, um, will he win another stage? I honestly, I think he could do, considering that the the. What, the people who were missing today from the sprint were, what, Cav and Pedersen, would you say? Were they the major sprinters that were missing today, pretty much? Basically, are Cav or... Is Cav or Mats going to beat Milan? I'd say that, you know, yes, they, they could maybe do, like Pedersen, I'd say. But, you know, if you're basically saying that Pedersen's not going to beat him, then that de facto probably means that Milan is going to win more. It seems like they brought the wrong team, then, to try and support that. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Otago should go for breakaways and go for the Maya Azura. Absolutely. Because he was good in the breaks last year. And let's face it, he's two minutes whatever down already. It's like, Otago, my guy. You could have to go in a break. Imagine if Gino Merda was here as well, if he didn't get COVID. This team would have been more silly. I'm, I'm excited to see what Bahrain can bring. They usually leave a grand tour with something at least to talk about. So I, I, I feel like we're going to have something at least for Bahrain, even if Caruso and those guys don't quite fire it in the GC fight. But even like there are other teams that probably have, they're probably happy with their performance. And to Marche with two guys in top 10, Nicola Bonifazio, Nicky Niceface, and Anna Maritz, who had a really, really good ride. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what other teams can bring. Maybe we're missing someone who didn't quite have the, the likes today that might fire later on, like a Dainese or Pippa Fiorelli as well from Green Project. I mean, anyways, shifting the conversation on to the, well, a Grand Tour, the Welta Femme, uh, Welta Espana, uh, the women's edition, but uh, apparently only seven stages, which I think is a bit of a disgrace. Almost like saying women can't race a three-week stage race, which I think is very, very bad. But uh, nevertheless, there was a bit of drama uh, on one of the penultimate stages. And Ewan, uh, what exactly happened? Well, seven stages, six of which were won by Dutch people, but not stage six. In the end, stage six ended up in La, um, in Laredo, which uh, I mean, there was a duo out in front. It was Gaia Riolini, very young Italian, who's uh, having a bit of a breakthrough season for Trek Zegafredo. She was up the road with the rainbow jersey, the world champion Anami van Vlerten, the reigning champion, actually, of this race uh, from last year. They were together all the way to the line. They went to the end. It was a photo finish initially given to Gaia Raelini. Then about 20 minutes later, it was handed over to Annemiek van Vlerten, who went on the podium to pick up the trophy. And then eventually it was given back to Gaia Raelini um, later on. So then Raelini got the trophy back. Uh, this ultimately meant that van Vlerten took over the race after Demi Vollering made a bit of a whoopsie. Uh, in the GC fight, and overall in the race, in the end, it was won by Annemiek van Vlerten after an interesting battle on the final stage of Lagos de Covadonga, where we saw van Vlerten and Vollering sort of have this battle. Uh, van Vlerten was dropped by Demi Vollering, who recently got the Ardennes triple. Vollering took the stage, but the advantage was not enough overall to take the leader's jersey. In the end, that goes to Annemiek van Vlerten with a nine-second gap over Vollering and a uh, two-minute and 41 advantage over Gaia Riolini in third place. So a great week for the young Italian, just what 22 no 21 years of age actually uh from pescara so yeah fabulous ride for her and i'm intrigued to see what she can bring in the weeks to come but she was a bit sort of cucked by uh by the organizers on 
on stage six where she was given the trophy, then not given it, then given it again. It was strange. You would be, you'd, you'd be a bit pissed, wouldn't you? You'd be like, like, come on, just you're a professional race organizer, like outfit here, and you're not even getting it right on a photo finish. It's like you literally just need to. I've seen the photo on Twitter, and it's pretty blatantly obvious. That, it, that she won from the bike throw. I'm not sure whether that image took kind of processing time, like exporting from Premiere Pro or something like that. But they're just like, what's going on here? It's kind of crazy to think that if she didn't win that, it would have been all stages won by Dutch people. And that's 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 kind of scary because it shows how dominant basically this one nation is in the whole of women's cycling. And yeah, I feel as like we touched on this before, but I just don't really know why the Dutch... They just have, I don't know, better infrastructure, but I don't, I don't know. It just seems like in the men's scene, lots of different nationalities are winning all the time. Well, but between a certain select kind of core group of, of people that we've pointed out. But in women's racing, it's literally just so condensed to that the people who do win are also the same nationality. Mm. So it's just kind of like, yeah. and also since we've got Charlotte Cool now, who's like this, like the new sprinter on the block kind of. And she she's also really fast as well. And it's like, oh gosh, another another Dutch sensation. Yeah, yeah. It seems like these sort of even the, this monopoly of teams as well, it's like there's such a great in imbalance or inequality of infrastructure and money and and investment going into these countries and different teams where stages are almost only won by five or so teams across all of the women's grand tours only a select amount of nationalities seem to really be involved i I can't explain that i mean the, the netherlands has always been quite good in sort of um in cycling at least and it must have been one of the best at sort of investing in women's cycling at, at an early age before other teams sort of caught on to uh the equality and discrepancy of equality uh, for for these riders' opportunities, but I guess it's kind of similar in women's football as well, where sort of only a select few teams are sort of really good uh, in terms of international and and sort of domestic teams. Where uh, the USA, the women, US women women's team is fantastic at football, a bit like how the the Dutch team is incredible at um, at uh, at women's cycling, and says they just have that dominance, and they have for, for so many years. Look, look at the history of like the women's football World Cup; it's mostly the US who won uh, every single World Cup. So it's interesting to see. I guess it's just there's, there's all this inequality of uh, of opportunities uh, between countries. I mean, that aside for a second, we're going to move on to apparently Ewan's favorite race of the year, Trovo Leon. You mentioned it a few times already. Yeah, wrong flag, Ewan. <laughs> He's got his Slovenian one. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I forgot that. I forgot we were going to talk about this one, so I'm just going to wrap it around. For audio listeners, there's there's currently a Brecken flag in, in frame. Um, yeah, I mean, Trevor Leon always delivers. It's actually, I would always say, it's one of the best sort of spectacle races of the year because it's so different. It's like Strada Bianca, but imagine it being muddy flat roads around Brittany, and it, and the race ends in this little village. Alana listen it's just it's just really really pretty I, I i love this race i think it's fantastic it's a shame it happens during the first weekend of the giro however this year it was a bit of a battle and we did see some crashes happen and some drama in the final couple of kilometers ugo ofstetter came down on the final mud section with about three kilometers to go he was taken out of the mix instead it looked to be a sprinter showdown between giacomo nizzolo and arno de lee de lee who's already won this week over in uh, the Grand Prix Morbihan, which is another Breton race uh, in the Coupe de France loop. So Dilly was sort of given the sort of impetus to do a lot of the work. Everyone was looking at Dilly in the final couple of kilometers. He began the sprint. He led it out. Nitzala came around him in the end. On the bike throw, Nitzala celebrated, hesitated before fully celebrating, but he took the win at Triboulet on this year. Head of Arno Dilly with third place going to Niels Eckhoff, fourth to Eddie Fine of Cofidis, and fifth to Rasmus Tiller of Unimex. A great race. I recommend watching the final couple kilometers of Trip early on. It's interesting. I watched the last 20k or so, and I, I always find it an interesting race. It seemed more attritional last year, I think, because it seemed um, a bit wetter and a bit muddier. This year seemed a little bit like the, uh, the off-road sections were a little bit more easy, were easier to handle. But it was still an exciting finale, and you know everybody was really looking at Dali. And after all, he'd won earlier in the week, and it was kind of him having to close down moves. And it really looked like he was going to win, but Nazolo just about got him on the line. But it was really impressive from... Um, Eddie Finney. He's finished twice in the top ten this week. 
And uh, as, for a rider who's just kind of I've like known of of his name, but he's never really done that much. I think that's a really good performance from him. And Sam Watson finished in tenth place, so that's that's good news for Yorkshire cycling. I also didn't want to I, I didn't want to go and be like Tropo Leon. That's basically you know when you said muddy off road sectors, I was like it's like the Rutland Sickle Classic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Please, wanna... don't, don't, don't mix these two races <laughs> together. Do not. I didn't want to oh, um, annoy you like that. But please, please. I've said it anyway, so there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, Eddie Fine, it's, it's cool to see him do pretty well. Uh, he's a rider from just outside Grenoble, uh, which is a very mountainous part of the country. 25 years of age, been in the World Tour for a couple of years, and yeah, just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting for a, for a result from him. So it's good to see him uh, to get something out of this one. I mean, we also had the Frankfurt race, uh, which is quite a well, a well right now. flag. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a stomping ground of Alexander Christoph for a while, but uh, uh, yeah, this year it was uh, one another Nordic in the form of Sam Karnas and taking a victory here for him. That's his first victory for his new team, Alps in De Koenig as well. So it's the first win he's had since um, his victory in Champagnol at the Tour Ooh. de France. Is it? I believe so. Really? That was an insane year for so his, Kral. His Indian summer, when he took the stage win in Lyon, then won in Champagnol. Yeah. Yeah. I remember also, that. It, it wasn't flashback. actually. It, it was Bing Bang Tour. He won an individual time trial. Oh, so, same God year. Damn. Though. Same year though. Why has he done this to us? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sam Khan isn't winning an individual time trial. How dare you? Oh. But the win basically came from a very small select group. It's an interesting race, but uh, Sam Khan isn't delivering a good win from uh, in his new team. But I mean, with that, I think we should get to, uh, well, Miguel Angel Lopez also won. We spoke about him last week crashing, but we won't dwell on that too much because he's basically an elite category rider in a junior's race, to be honest. He shouldn't really be at that level, but we all know why. But nevertheless, coming to rider of the week, <laughs> shall we go with Ewan first this time? We always go with Patrick. So Ewan, who's your rider yeah, of the on, week? Ewan. This week or next episode? Is... I'm thinking I'm pensive. Um, I'm kind of... I, st- I still don't really know for me. I mean, you can't put Samuel Watson just because oh. he's top 10 in trouble. Oh, okay. I'd at love, least Sam Carr Anderson's won a stage win. Oh, it's a race. Uh, yeah, that's I'm not, true. I'm not picking him, but... I've got... Uh, um, You stole my rider last week, so... Did I? Yeah. Oh, shit. Got a name in mind. But if you and pick... So... Oh, no, go for it. Go for it. You go first. <laughs> so I am going to pick... Because I remember... Because you said before we started recording, Scott, but we never... We've never had a repeat rider of a week. No. Nope. Well, that ends today. Because my rider of week is Arno De Lee, who I'm fairly certain was Wait. one of our first rider of the weeks. Almost yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And it was the Evie Etoile de Bessage. Yeah, he was ruthless. He is my rider of the week because he almost, almost won Trobro Leon today. But he was lent on an awful lot in that last kilometre. And he also won the Grand Prix du Maubehan. Maubehan. And I'm just like, well, you know what? I'll go with him because he's he's done pretty good. He's come on the podium twice in two one day races, so that's pretty good. Uh, just because we didn't have time to talk about transfers this week, and I really want to hit the algorithm this week, I'm going to go for Enoch Malubran from Eritrea because he is currently linked to Astana, Kazakhstan for next year, according to us. Um, that gets out uh, of the the African champion right now. There we go. Actually... He's riding the Giro. So there we go. Hijacking this this feature once again. He's linked to Astana. Oh yeah. no, that's terrible news. That is, yeah, that's a bit sad. Oh well, they have had a, a trains there before, so yeah, maybe. Yeah, apparently Dianese is rumored to be going to Trek. I just thought I'd throw that in there since we were, since we had one little transfer rumor. I thought I'd just throw that in there. Do we have any news on Jorgensen? Has he responded? Uh. No, I don't think he has. That's sad. Because we don't want him coming to Yumba. No, he blocked my number, so I can't call him anymore. I think it was the 20 missed calls I gave him. I freaked him out. It's understandable. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, I'm going to go for 
Well, let's just keep it easy. So I'm kind of I was thinking about doing Jack uh, Rootkin Gray, who's won a race in Norway and seemed to be the only non Scandinavian or Polish rider in that race. So fair play to him, only 20 years old. But equally, we could have said uh, John Tamerlan for taking his first Giro stage in yeah, yeah. <laughs> Henok is going to Astana. That is bad. I don't like this. I don't you, like you that either. You can't just drop this last minute. Yeah, that's really ruined my day. Yeah, what is why would based you go on? to Astana? <laughs> is this because they're semi-Italian and he's in an Italian team? So it's uh, why couldn't move? he just go to Intermarche and it's like him and Vinny? Would that not make? Yeah, that's true. That would be too predictable. Yeah, but we like predictable. No, we don't. Why not? What's he going to do at Astana? Be part of Mark Cavendish's leader oh, train? I was about, was about to say that, yeah. He will be. Yeah, it's Mark like... Cavendish will be leading him out next year. Oh, the... Did you see the video on Twitter? Side note about Mark Cavendish. Did you see the video on Twitter that Astana Kazakhstan posted? It was Mark Cavendish sat on like a train and all the replies are like, this is the closest Cav's going to get to a train during this Chiro. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was the funniest comment section I think I've seen on cycling Twitter in a while. And that's hard. It doesn't normally make me laugh. That's, you can cut that out. That was a bitchy comment. Yeah. <laughs> nah, Henock will be helping Lutsenko to finish 8th slash 9th slash 10th in the tour. Based. GC. Yeah, That's literally what he's going to be doing. Yeah, but, like, what he's, the, of... he's the African Alexei Lutsenko. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not a bad career. Who did, who did we compare to Lutsenko the other week? I can't remember, but we just keep Kevin on Vauclan. doing this. <laughs> yeah, it was, Kevin Vuklom was the French Alexa Lutsenko and then we said someone else was another version of Alexa Lutsenko this is just and, a running thing now but now Hedlock is the, is the Eritrean Lutsenko it makes so much sense everyone is we're gonna go we'll do like a designated video of who is the Lutsenko of each nationality we all have a little bit of a like Alexa Lutsenko inside of us yeah we do spiritually not physically but okay uh, Henok will try and keep that point. What would he do at Astana? Would you advise him to go there or not? No. Trek like air trains. Enter my share like air trains. I've got, well, Trek have, have got one air train. <laughs> so, have we got two. Sure. Have, have, They're both in the Jiro right now. Yeah, they literally were uh, working in the train today, both of them. I went well. <laughs> It wasn't their fault. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't joking. that fault. <laughs> I don't even know whose fault it was. It People was quick steps Ackerman. for pushing Yombo into them. It was no. Ackerman who pushed into. No, so, so, um, so Remco in the post race interview said that there was somebody to blame, but he didn't name drop them. And if you look at the video, it's actually because a, a rider, a rider who rhymes with Schmaden Schmoves. Um, pushes Davide Ballerini out of the train. So th th they're fighting for the same bit of road. Davide Ballerini uh, gets pushed by by Schmaden Schmoes. <laughs> and come on, an anonymity. Um, and uh, Davide Ballerini kind of wobbles because he's like just being pushed, like tapped over on the shoulder. Uh, and then that causes the incident. I think that's what Remco was uh, alluding to. But yeah, I, I people are saying Ackerman and so forth, but I think that's unfair. Yeah, it looks like it, it was Schmid and Schmoes's fault. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, yeah, Hanok. I don't know. I'm looking at teams. Where would he fit? He would fit better in almost any outfit. He should just go to like Jayco because they're pretty washed, and he'll actually get opportunities there. Jayco is such a snooze fest. I mean, literally, not, like Simon Yates goes into a race, DNFs within a couple of days. Michael Matthews is fine for like the tenth place in bunch sprints to then hopefully get in. Like he literally has a better chance of winning like medium mountain stages now, like he did at the tour last year. Like this isn't Michael Matthews of like you know a few years ago, where he was like massively like you you know he needs stages like basically like the Canadian races to do well, of which. They've just they, they don't I don't know they don't seem to appear in the Grand Tours too much anymore or like not this year and which is kind of weird he'd he'd fit in okay there considering that they're literally going for Dunbar in GC which is kind of mad I I feel like he could fit in there where else could he go <laughs> like if he, anywhere but Astana he could go to Trek he could go to Intermarche he could go to EF Cofferdis 
for crying out loud, just anywhere that isn't yeah. Astana. Was that uh, uh, Hani? Uh, he was in Coffee Days for a while. Yeah, yeah, he was everywhere for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if any team was switched off enough, and they well, I switched on enough for it rather, and they saw sort of um, analytics of for Enoch Malubran, I feel like they would um, pick him up. Mm. Release a Malubran merchandise line safe. Yeah, true. yeah, literally. I just don't get what he's going to do at Astana though. Um, and speaking of Astana, sell a merchandise line. <laughs> what what is going to happen to Astana when they when Lutsenko eventually like leaves the World Tour because just from retirement, or are they just planning on keeping him going until he's forty five? <laughs> like because that, everybody, right? So they become Lutsenko. I can't even tell you. They have like twenty Kazakhstan riders on their team, and I can't name fifteen of them. Because I don't, I, they're just so random that I'm just like, what's going on here? There doesn't seem to be a, a structure. It's Lutsenko, Cav, and then just put some respect on your Vengi Fedorov's name, please. Yeah, but you may as well throw Hedok in there. Like, I don't know. Like, Hedok, is he going to, if he goes to Astana, he will absolutely have his own opportunities. Oh, Kudos was in Astana. That was the right I was thinking of for Metro. Yeah, okay, just, go on. Astana just don't really. They kind of occasionally do stuff, but for, his, for sake of his career progression, I would just hope that he go, doesn't go there. Because <laughs> it never really seems to go that great for riders who go there. I think especially, like, is David De La Cruz back there now? Yeah, he is. That's not gone What well. a homecoming. <laughs> well, anyways, on that note, Henok, don't go to Astana. That's our advice. And, of course, there's always... Well, this is our 15th episode, I think. We're available on all the different podcast platforms. That writer of the week turned it into a bit more of a transfer. <laughs> Apologies. I really, I really shouldn't have hijacked that. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> to use it as, as a transfer news thing. I just didn't know who to give it to, so... I wanted to give give a little scoop that I got in the past couple of hours. But yeah, anyways, with that, that's it for the 15th episode. Make sure to check us out on all the different uh, podcast platforms, Spotify, etc., etc. And of course, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and let us know down below if there's anything you've agreed with, disagreed with, who do you think is going to win the Giro d'Italia, etc., etc. And of course, as always, until next week, thank you for watching and have a nice day. <laughs>